Um, can you hear me? Is this mic on? Okay, cool. So, um, oh, okay, if you present me very well, but uh, I must say this uh, title is a bit deceiving because um, this is a two-part lecture. Basically, the first part, part will be about uh, Microsoft and how we do stuff there, and only the second part will be like based on uh, machine learning and how uh, how uh, how it is used in uh, some en energy industry and sports as well. Okay, maybe. Ah. <laughs> so a bit about Microsoft Development Center Serbia. So um, it was established in 2005. I think uh, originally it had like four employees. Um, now it has 220 in various teams. Um, basically, uh, the, uh, we have like uh, many different roles. Between them is, of course, a data science role. And uh, we have uh, four different teams, uh, four different major teams, which are SQL, Office, Bing, and uh, analog or handwriting recognition. And there is one secret team I cannot talk about. <laughs> and uh, uh, Microsoft is uh, known for hiring like local superstars, like Olympics, medals, whatever. But basically, uh, what people don't know is our focus, like it's easy to hire someone who has a really good track record. But um, what we focus on is discovering new talents, like which are not obvious to, do, to, to the market and everything. And uh, what we are proud of is that we are a startup within a corporation. So we are extremely like most of our teams are extremely independent from like the Redmond he headquarters we have our own projects we have uh, the independence to to create our own projects and to develop them and like we just have to ask for money right so, um, uh, so uh, what about data science in Microsoft so uh, Microsoft as a as a corporation like does invest heavily in data-driven culture, especially um, in the past few years of uh, increased uh, development of cloud technologies and everything. And uh, MDCS, Microsoft Development Center Serbia, um, is first trying to follow that data-driven culture, but then the idea is, of course, as in software engineering, to lead the way, um, to pave the way for, for uh, to be sort of center of excellence for, for data science, as it is for software engineering in the future. Um, there are several areas being worked on in several teams, like machine learning, time series analysis, hypothesis testing, etc. cetera. Um, and this is, this is the expanding role currently. So it's an expanding team. But the thing is, um, uh, what my manager told me is like, prove your value and we will give you funding. So there's n nothing is just given. Just you need to first prove the value of the team you already have, show us how much money you bring or how much value you bring, and then you can have funding for more people, etc. So I think it's a sustainable, sustainable thing. Um, so I work uh, as a data scientist at, uh, at the Azure SQL team. So just a bit of intro for people who don't know. Um, I didn't know before I joined Microsoft. <laughs> um, this is Azure is a Microsoft cloud service. And uh, Azure SQL DB is the service within Azure for storing SQL databases uh, on cloud. So um, before, you had like in, in Belgrade, uh, a box product or a SQL server was developed. And uh, this, when you're developing a po box product, it's a multi-year project, right? So uh, it is based on some, a lot of assumptions made by engineers. It's based on communication of, of product managers with a limited number of customers. And basically, because you make assumptions, you don't know how many, how users are using your product, right? So now with cloud technologies, you have possibilities of, of customer insight like never before. You can, you can actually see how they are using the product and you can tweak the product such that it fits to 99% of customers. You can never like have 100% of satisfaction, but we have this 99% approach where we, uh, we develop models which tweak our product, product such that 99% of customers use it in a proper way. So and this is the framework on the, on the right hand side, I guess. Um, so uh, first, we have a, a product, right, which is within cloud. 
um, uh, from, from the box product, uh, it goes into cloud. Now we make some insights about it. Uh, we see how it is being used by customers, where, whether they are using it properly, whether it's optimal. And then we develop models to tweak the features um, in order to expand the scope of customers who, are, who can use it properly and uh, uh, to tweak uh, by their behavior. Then we go into private preview. So we uh, put these new features with uh, improved features to a limited number of customers, see, test it, see how they're using it. And then if it's fine, it goes into general availability for all customers on cloud. And then if it behaves nice, it goes into the box product or, or uh, SQL Server. Okay, now we have like a strategy we uh, employ into uh, our data science team, but there is a, so a bit of an intro to this strategy. So um, uh, what would happen to your company if it were to you lose all data scientists? Now this is a bit harsh question. The question is what would happen if it were to lose most data scientists? And this um, uh, question was motivated from my, well, modest experience, but um, I've noticed that in a lot of teams, companies, even in Microsoft, but not in Belgrade, um, in some teams, uh, a lot of data science does not prove its value. Um, for instance, I, I worked in, in finance before, in investment banking, and uh, I worked in risk management. And basically, 90% of data scientists there, there would be fired within a month if regulations didn't exist. Um, which is like, and some teams in Microsoft have data science only because it's cool to say that they are data driven. Um, and basically, even when you do make some data science models, and even when you do make some insights, um, it's uh, some, uh, a lot, in a lot of times management doesn't use this, these insights, like because they don't understand it, the co co models are too complex, they don't have the technical skills to understand them or they don't have the time to dig uh, deeper. Um, sometimes, of course, data scientists do make mistakes by themselves. So they, they make these super complex models which are absolutely unscalable for the infrastructure. Um, and basically, another thing is uh, data scientists oftentimes, from my experience, do, don't have these uh, marketing skills. They, 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 you need internal market marketing to push through, especially when you're working in an independent, separated data science team. Um, also, a lot of companies then employ some policies which say, like in investment bank, it's like, oh, you're a trader, you have to work with, uh, I don't know, quantitative analyst, uh, blah, blah, but it really doesn't work that way. I mean, if a man doesn't have time, the last thing was on his mind is to cooperate with a data scientist, right? Um, so, uh, I'm not saying, of course, data science is the future, right? But uh, it, the, the, if it is at one point perceived that it's not adding enough value, plus currently, I don't know about the state in, in Belgrade yet, but I, I, at the West it's definitely like that. It, they're hi hiring heavily. Um, then like uh, you, you'll get a bubble, right? And the question is because data science has future in my opinion, uh, the question is, is it going, going to follow dot com or, or smartphone industry path? So like, is, it, is the bubble going to burst if we are in a bubble? And then uh, get the sustainable growth or we'll just keep growing exponentially, like until now. Um, now, that being said, said uh, we at Microsoft employ a low risk <laughs> strategy. So our solution to everything that was just said are mixed teams. So um, software engineers working together with data scientists really closely. So for instance, um, I lead a team of six people and uh, three of them are uh, software engineers, three of them are data scientists. Software engineers do some simple data science models, data scientists do some uh, simple engineering stuff. Um, in that way, you work to the smallest detail with the engineer. So, uh, and you get the complete understanding between each other's works and models, etc. So, in that way, what you get 
is a mesh, basically a grid where you have data scientist signature all over the product. Um, and data science models become inseparable part of each product we develop. Um, so um, that's how we try to prove our value, right? So uh, th does this mean that we never do data science, like data science stuff? Of course not. I mean, but the thing is, we build this expert system to get expert systems together with engineers to prove our, prove our value, and then this. Uh, gives us like freedom to experiment with all sorts of machine learning stuff, uh, autoregressive, FFT, etc. Um, yes, so how, how would this strategy map to, to different uh, companies or industries? So, um, for instance, in, in finance, in banks, uh, you would have, a, I don't know, like I'm going to try to, to use conventional banking here, like credit sales together with quantitative analysts to uh, build models together. So credit sales know what they need. Quantitative anal analysts oftentimes don't know what credit sales need. So like if they would be a team working together to the smallest detail, I think quants would uh, bring more value to, to, to the banks. Also, this would... Uh, this would be the same for management working together with BI teams and, of course, as in Microsoft, in my opinion, engineers with data scientists. Um, now, this approach is good for large companies or companies with mature uh, data-driven culture. But uh, if the company is new to data science and tries to experiment with it, see, see what would it bring. So uh, data science itself needs to prove value. Um, and, like, in my opinion, the most effective way for this is machine learning. Uh, especially today, because uh, you have these machine learning tools which are user-friendly, easy to implement, etc. You can have, like, your models built within a month or something. Um, so that's, like, the most effective way of, of implementing machine learning. And this leads us to, to Azure ML. Now, before I go on, um, I would like to stress this, uh, th this talk will not be an ad <laughs> for Azure ML, although it, it will seem like that, right? Uh, <laughs> it, it will be an ad for, for using machine learning in all sorts of different industries, like experimenting with, with ML. Um, well, of course, if more companies use ML, the more companies will use Azure ML as well, so. <laughs> um, so what is what is Azure ML? It is it is a service within Azure. Um, it's a fully managed cloud service which actually uh, allows you to uh, build uh, machine learning models and the whole pipelines um, in a user friendly environment. So it's just a um, drag and drag and drop interface. Of course, it's not like like your grandmother can implement this, but still, it's like. Um, you do need some like uh, feature engineering. It has to go through some Python or R or whatever. But still, it's very easy to implement. It's very it, um, it's supposed to do that, <laughs> and it's supposed to um, uh, be easy evaluation of of, of models, etc. And it has uh, hundreds of built-in packages and models, which which allows you to just drag and drop basically. So um, these are some um, examples of where uh, Azure ML has been implemented. But as I said, it's more about machine learning than it is about Azure ML. Um, but the, the, these examples were interesting to me. So for instance, uh, there was this public high school in USA which had uh, uh, just, uh, just catastrophic graduation rate. So like 55% of people who would sign in this, this uh, high school would actually graduate. 45% of them would drop out it's high school, it's, it's not even faculty. Um, and basically, so what, what they wanted to do is uh, to predict dropout probability for, for each student. So um, they would get like all sorts of uh, information they have, data they have about each student. Uh, they, they put it as a features into, into the uh, Azure ML models. And they would get, uh, based on historical data, it was trained, and they would get 
uh, probability for each student, probability of dropout for each student. Now, and this uh, would actually point also to areas of intervention for each student. So, for instance, whether they, uh, if they have a large uh, high probability of dropping out, uh, whether they need help with reading, with math, or maybe so some issues where, for which they need to visit psychologists or whatever. And this model actually had 90% accuracy, and within four years, it jumped from 55% to around 80%, the graduation rate. So, yeah, um, I think our education system is a bit far from that, but yeah, still, it's, it's a good uh, case study. And uh, another example is uh, uh, an aircraft engine producer. Um, for me, this was a bit frightening. So, um, engine uh, aircraft engine producers um, want to decrease the maintenance costs. So, what they did, like, is because before it was done on some fixed time periods for which they were safe, it would not break. But now they were like, okay, it's expensive, let's optimize this using... Uh, machine learning, so they put uh, all sorts of sensors like uh, inside and around the engine. And then like they tested these engines heavily on the ground, of course, and basically then they would uh, just uh, uh, learn the, their models, machine learning models uh, on, on the failure, and based on this, they, they have a predicting, uh, predictive maintenance. So basically, what the sensors show, okay, it might break within a day or something, so let's fix it or whatever. Um, another example is the bank. Basically, of course, like, if you're a loan seeker, um, you go to a bank and you get into one of the free buckets. You have four, five, six percent interest rates, and, and that's it. Um, but basically, using machine learning, you can have a probability of default or probability of bankruptcy for each loan seeker. And uh, basically, if you have this custom-made probability, you can have a tailor-made uh, interest rate that I offer. Basically, if, if, if you lower the interest rate or increase the down payment to minimize the probability of bankruptcy for each, uh, for each loan seeker. And uh, the fourth example is the oil, co oil company. So all companies, when they're digging out oils, oil, they have these tanks which occasionally spill. Like, and uh, these spills are prevented by periodic pickup by trucks. And uh, based on some sensors inside the tanks, um, they do prediction of oil re levels where the features are, are, one of the features is a time derivative of the increase of oil levels in tanks. And uh, then they, ha they produce some alerts based on predictions of levels in, in tanks and just pick up by trucks when, when it's needed. I'm going to uh, dig deeper into two examples from the title. So one is, uh, one is sports industry. So um, this is based on a true story. <laughs> it's, not, it's not actually true because there, there is a... Um, we had some confidentiality agreement with this uh, with this sports team, so like it's not actually an NFL, NFL team, but let's say it's an NFL team. Um, so they had a problem; they were marketing um, uh, seasonal ticket packages, but completely non-targeted. So they would just like do it on TV or whatever. I mean, and uh, they thought maybe it would be a good idea to uh, use machine learning to identify uh, potential customers who are more likely to purchase season tickets next year, um, and also to identify current season ticket holders and see the probability of them um, actually not buying the season ticket next year, right? So um, the, the, the reason was to actually identify the high probability ones in each packet, and uh, target target marketing on them, tailor offers for them for them, etc. Basically, to to they, they they want as many season ticket package customers as possible, and of course the business goal is as always to to increase the revenues. Um, so when you start working on a project like this, I guess like the first step is of course is some pre-analysis, logical, etc. So. First of all, like most customers, whatever you do, 
unless you give them a season ticket for free, will not change their purchasing plans. Um, but the question is, what, w why do customers who do change plans, what are their characteristics? W w w why do they do that? So basically, it depends on several things. So I've listed a few here. So basically, the historical preference. So maybe someone was buying a season ticket for 10 years in a row and then just stopped at one point, uh, etc. Uh, purchasing behavioral patterns. So maybe someone is buying a ticket, whether someone is buying a ticket like long in advance or after a game has already started, etc. Um, attendance patterns. Also, the financial status, of course, people who have more money are more likely to buy season tickets because they are more expensive. Age, of course, 25-year-old uh, is more likely to change the purchasing plan than the 65-year-old. And the job, I mean, like, I don't know, investment banker will not buy a season ticket because he will not go to a single game. And, um, so, um, and uh, so... Okay, so we have some some features, like some set of features we want we want to implement, and now we look at what data sources we have. Like, so the the team itself has customer information, they have uh, historical sales re sales records, and they have historical attendance records. And from the third party vendor, they have some analytics data about each customer. So this this vendor actually takes uh, the av available data for from the team. They, they go through their models and then they spit out like output which is like um, he's a basketball fan as well or whatever like uh, he, he prefers other team than yours etc so we combine like not we it's not done in Belgrade but <laughs> the, we as Microsoft combine available data sources and uh, uh, available data sources from the previous slide, as well as the characteristics fr from pre-analysis, so these feature sets or whatever, to, be to build a, a full feature set needed for, for making the predictions about, uh, about uh, um, season ticket holders. And uh, this, we, we split this feature set into two, um, two, two, two subsets, right? So we have a raw data set. This is, this, these are the features which are directly observable from the team's, um, uh, fr from the, the, the team's data sources. And uh, these are some, I don't know, like gender occupation, is he a season ticket holder or not, et cetera. And uh, we, uh, from the, for the features which we need for predictions but are not available in the raw data set, we, you know, we infer them from the raw data using sa some models. So, I mean, it's not a model actually, it's just like calculating the distribution of price he is willing to pay for the ticket and uh, which team he prefers to watch, et cetera. And in the final data set, we will have like, we, we did have like uh, over a hundred features. Much, much more actually. Um, so, and within this like feature set, we had two labels uh, we wanted to test. We wanted to test four class classifier. So which would, um, uh, we, which would mark all the possible transitions, right? So from the non-season ticket holder to season ticket holder and vice versa and keep non-season, keep season ticket um, for each customer. So we want to calculate probability for each of the transitions for each of the customers. The other one is the binary classifier, which is just like change current purchasing plan, do not change the current purchasing plans plan and we wanted to test these two and see like build the different models for them and see which one performs better so uh, i don't think uh, you can see it well here but basically um uh, this is the azure ml interface so what we do here is just uh, um, just drag and drop like a bunch of different models right a bunch of different algorithms so like um Decision tree, random forest, uh, logistic regression, some neural networks, depends on the classifier, of course. And basically, we take the 70% of the available uh, historical data for training all of the models and 30% from for testing. Actually, we are testing for accuracy of predictions uh, of each of the models. And we compare them based on that, and we try to see 
which uh, algorithm would perform best for the four class classifier, which would perform best for the binary classifier, and then compare these two together. And uh, uh, basically, two class uh, boosted decision tree was uh, better. Um, well, best in terms of, of accuracy in this case, but it really doesn't matter. I mean, it's just, just an example. Now, the final solution architecture, how does it look like? So basically, we all of the uh, NFL team's data is in Azure SQL DB. It is being grabbed from, from the Azure SQL DB using Azure Data Factory, which is like a pipeline tool. tool. Uh, so it is being read from Azure SQL DB. Um, we do some feature engineering, uh, uh, like inferring features from raw data using some Python scripts. And uh, basically we model, uh, well, we learn the model using Azure ML, basically. We, we employ this model using Azure ML. And the results are stored in Azure Storage. And this is all connected then to the team's marketing system, based on which they, they decide uh, how to employ uh, uh, targeted marketing for e which customer in which way, etc. So that was the example for the sports industry, and I will just briefly go over the over the energy industry uh, case study. So you had this uh, New York Power Energy, energy Distributor, and uh, they wanted two things basically. They wanted to analyze real-time power energy consumption like several different stats, but what they also wanted is to predict like uh, what would be the consumption within the next 24 hours. So um, they used uh, all sorts of Azure tools for this. So in the two upper thirds of this, let me see, okay, it doesn't have a laser. Um, uh, in the two, two thirds of this uh, picture, these are just real-time analytics, basically. So um, co power consumption by region, by time, average, by hour, etc., by customer. But the below, like the, the final row here, is the forecast. So on the leftmost side, that's like from the third party vendor uh, temperature predictions. So the, the black part is the past temperature and uh, the orange part is the, is the predicted temperature. And based on this temperature and based on this uh, uh, real-time analytics, um, future consumption, uh, uh, power energy consumption is predicted with some, with some margin of error. And this is in the middle and on the, uh, on the rightmost part is the error rate, like so, the error of the prediction model in history, right, right by time. So it goes between two and and uh, three, four percent, uh, usually. Um, so, and th this is just the again the solution uh, architecture. So uh, some Azure Web Job is taking the data from the uh, power energy distributor F from the weather data and the weather data and predictions. Um, this goes, okay, th this upper part is for the real-time processing, real-time analytics, but the, the lower part is, goes into Azure SQL, which then uh, goes using ADF, Azure Data Factory, into Azure ML model, which then calculates the predictions, bring them back to Azure SQL, which goes into this uh, BI, BI tool for observing the, the, the future consumption. So, um, okay, I'm okay. <laughs> so, uh, to conclude, um, as I said, like many different companies employ different data science strategies. Like we employ expert systems, but th there are companies which employ independent data systems, uh, data, data, data science teams, <laughs> and uh, some, some using, of course, third-party vendors for, for doing all, all the analysis for them and modeling. Um, and if the company is new uh, in, in terms of data science, the most efficient thing to start with is like some user-friendly ML tools, which can be really quickly employed. Deployed, I guess. Um, so it can be used as a proof of concept of value added by uh, by data-driven culture. And the example of this tool is Azure ML. And there, I've shown so I've shown some success stories in widest range of areas by employing um, ML, like education, energy, finance, etc. So, thank you.
da neko pitanje za Igora, možete sad da postavite. To bi bilo to. Hvala. Ok.